Well, I've literally had no emails asking me to do a what's in your bag. But despite this, I thought I would do one anyway, but I thought I would do it a bit differently. So it's not necessarily what's in my bag, but what's been in my bag. You'll see, run the titles. So I thought I'd do a little video to uh, show you the cameras I've been using over the years that brought me to the system that I'm using now. So we'll go all the way back to 1986 and my first camera, which was the Pentax P30. Now this is my first proper SLR camera, my first proper film camera, the one I cut my teeth on and I had this for about two years. I chose this Pentax P30 because it had a program mode as well as full manual. I didn't understand shutter speeds or apertures at all at that stage and so I thought I'd be safe if I have a full program mode and I could just take pictures like a point and shoot. Funnily enough, when I actually came to use the camera, it took me a couple of weeks to learn how to use apertures and I never used it on program again. I used it in full manual. But this camera came with a 50mm lens, as did all cameras in those days, and that was the first lens I used with this camera, obviously. Now, fast forward two years, um, I was fortunate enough to come into a bit of inheritance money, it's £500, but I was 18. Instead of buying a motorbike or putting it towards a car, I decided to blow it all on a top-end Canon T90, the flagship Canon at that time. This was like the Porsche of cameras, all sleek lines and high-tech interior. It was my dream camera, I had the money, so I just blew the lot on this camera. An absolute beautiful camera, and it took me into my first steps of being a professional photographer. It's what I took my first pictures on, and the ones I sold when I was first starting out. I had this camera up to about three years ago, when it eventually died. I think it's up in the loft somewhere, but a great camera. Now, I turned professional in 1995, and at that time, if you wanted to sell your images, especially for front covers of magazines and calendars, that sort of thing, you needed to shoot on a bigger format. And so that's when I made my upgrade to a medium format camera, and my camera choice was the Mamiya RZ67. Well, this was a big, hefty camera, probably more suited to the studio than taken out in the landscape. And most landscape photographers at the time were shooting with the SLR-like Pentax 7 But I really liked the modular form of the Mamiya. I loved the rotating back, which meant you didn't have to turn it to shoot verticals. And I loved the waist level viewfinder, so you could look down into the uh, viewfinder to frame your shot. A bit like using a Hasselblad, which I couldn't afford at the time. But the results you got from it were absolutely superb. Beautiful uh, transparencies, because I was shooting on Fuji Velvia 50 at the time. That was the film that everybody used for the colour saturation. It was also my first camera that had a shift lens. Um, I was shooting all primes for the system, so I had a 50mm wide angle, the 75mm shift, a 90mm and then a 180mm telephoto. All big lenses, but that's what came with the system. And of course this camera had no internal metering, so all readings were taken with a handheld meter or with a spot meter. That's me miming taking a spot meter reading. But that camera served me well and I used it throughout my early years as a professional photographer but I was yearning for something even bigger. Not bigger overall but bigger wider. Well I've been shooting 6x7 transparencies with the Mimia but I was often cropping that down to a panoramic within that transparency. That meant I was losing lots of detail and therefore I wasn't getting as big of an image as I could. So in 2003 I invested in my biggest and best camera so far the Fuji GX617. This really was a beast of a camera, but as I say, probably my favorite camera of all time. Pause. It's pretty being important. Right, we're still rolling then, are we? Yes, we are still rolling. <clears throat> the Fuji GX617. This really was a beast of a camera, but at the same time, probably my favourite camera of all time. And the results sitting on the light box, absolutely amazing. Again, no internal metering, so you had to use a separate handheld meter or spot meter. Uh, so if you got the results wrong, it cost you dearly. Well, I had two lenses for this camera, a 90mm and a 180mm. And that's equivalent to 50 and a 90 on a digital SLR these days. I used to carry that, all that in my backpack with the Mamiya kit. No wonder my back's suffering these days. But in 2005, I wanted to downsize slightly, which was equivalent of doing what I'm doing today with the Olympus, but I wanted to stay with medium format film. And back then, the choice then was a, a Fuji 
GSW69. This gave me 6x9 transparencies, but in a more compact body than the Mimir could give me, and that meant I could take it out and use it more as a travel camera. The other advantage to this camera is that I could shoot buildings without having to use a shift lens. Because I was shooting in a 6x9 format, it meant I could frame up a shot of a building, keeping the camera straight and keeping the building straight with the conver no converging verticals. And then I'll crop off the bottom two centimeters of the frame so it would come back to 6x7, which is what I was shooting on the Mimir. And therefore I'd have a perfectly straight shot of a building in 6x7. Perfect. Now during this time I also experimented with a lot of other film cameras, many of which you've seen in my other videos. So there's the Holger, the Lubital 166, and the Zero Image 2000 pinhole camera. All great cameras and all giving me a very different look which I was looking for at that time pre-digital. So in 2007 I made the move over to digital and the camera that convinced me to make that move was the Canon 5D Mark I, the original. So I sold all my film gear, all the Mamiya and eventually the Panoramic and I invested in the Canon system. It was chance to downsize at last downsized from that huge Mamiya system I've been using to a much smaller, lighter system and also downsized in running costs too. At that time I was shooting with zoom lenses so I had the 17 to 40 zoom, a 50mm standard and a 70 to 200 telephoto. Oh, and I also had a 24mm shift lens which replaced the shift lens I had with the Mamiya system. Well, I ran that camera for a few years and then in 2010 I upgraded to the Mark II of the 5D. Another great camera, more megapixels this time and also that dust removal system which the original 5D didn't have. Those dust bunnies disappeared overnight. I also made the move from shooting with zoom lenses to prime lenses. So I had the 24mm shift lens and to that I added a 35mm, I had the 50mm already and I added a 90mm, so a complete system of prime lenses which I preferred for my shooting of landscapes. Now fast forward to 2012, um, this was my first introduction to the Micro Four Third system. As you all probably know, I shoot mirrorless with the Olympus system, but I first started with the Panasonic GF1. This was a 12 megapixel Micro Four Third system, didn't have the same quality sensor as the new Olympus models have, but it was my first uh, downsizing to a more compact camera, a travel camera to carry with me at all times. I had two lenses for this camera, the 14mm and the 20mm pancake lenses, and it really showed me that this was the way forward and I could see myself downsizing completely in the future. And therefore, just a year later, in 2013, I bought my first Olympus OMD camera, the EM5 Mark I. I actually went to the photography show at Birmingham to check out the new Fuji which is part of the X-Series range and at the time it was the X-E1 that had just been released. I was convinced this was the camera I was actually going to be going over to. I liked the style but when I held it in my hands it just didn't feel right. So I popped over to the Olympus stand, picked up the EM5, that was the one. I was smitten straight from the start. This was the camera this was the one to go for. So I bought the camera for a few weeks later and started investing into the system. Of course I could still use the two lenses I had from the Panasonic on the new Olympus system but I soon invested in a set of primes and that's how I wanted to shoot with this camera to keep it nice and compact. So I have the 12mm, the 17mm, the 25mm, 45mm and a 16mm from Sigma. Oh and of course the fisheye. And then just a year later, uh, Olympus released the EM1 Mark I, and so I upgraded to that camera. It was a better camera, had more features, better image stabilizing, and also had that built-in grip, which was really nice. So that's what I went for next. And then that, later that year, I also bought a Olympus EP5. I wanted a, a backup camera, but obviously something that fitted within the system. Um, I later found out that that was a better camera at long exposures because it didn't have the phase detection autofocus that the EM1 has and that's where the noise is uh, a problem with that camera. But it was EP5 was a great retro camera, really nice looking and it was a great camera for using for street photography. So that's my camera that I'm using today, the Olympus system. Um, I've since added the 12 to 40 Pro zoom as well as a Panasonic 35 to 100 zoom which I chose over the Olympus equivalent because it's a much more 
compact lens, still great quality and still the f2.8 aperture, but it's more compact. And for me, the whole point of this system is your downsizing. So having that smaller form in the Panasonic version made sense to me. And so that's the cameras I'm using now. And they're the cameras I've had in my bag up until now. Well, thank you for watching. And of course, thank you for everybody who has subscribed to my channel. Thank you for getting me over the 10,000 mark and beyond now. Thanks for all the likes and the dislikes and all the comments, good or bad, all appreciated. I'll see you on the next one.